will pioneer another proof today. And in this video, we will derive pi using calculus, not just drawing a circle in the dirt, then measuring it using a measuring stick of some kind. That's so barbaric, uncivilized, stuff like that, you know? So we're going to be using the more sophisticated and modern approach of using calculus. So we have a circle, but, you know, how do you calculate its circumference? What is it? Don't worry, we will answer this question today by constructing a circle with radius r in the xy plane centered at the origin. And the equation for this is the square root of x squared plus y squared is equal to r. In other words, uh, this means that our circle consists of the set of all points in which the distance away from the origin is equal to r. So we can express the equation for a circle in terms of y as a function of x, as shown right over here. And notice that we have a plus or minus sign in front of the expression for y. So what we're going to do is that we're going to break it down into subsets that we will call y up and y down. y up, in orange right there, represents the top part of the circle. And, oh shoot, where am I? Oh yeah, y up represents the top part of the circle, whereas the y down represents the bottom part of the circle. Thus, the set of all y is the union. It is the union of y up and y down. Therefore, we can say that if s tot is the arc length or circumference of our circle, then the total arc length of the circle is the sum of the arc length of the top section of the circle and the arc length of the bottom section of this circle. So here we're going to quickly derive the equation for arc length of a curve in the xy plane. The arc length s is the integral from uh, s min to s max of ds, where ds is the square root of dx squared plus dy squared. So that is a length differential in the xy plane. So, yeah, there's the equation for s over there, expressed in terms of x this time. And now we're going to do um, uh, the rest of this stuff over here. And if, if we do this, the further simplification, then we obtain the arc length s in the xy plane in terms of x. So we have our general equation for arc length in blue. We can now determine the total arc length of the circle by taking the sum of the arc lengths of the top and bottom sections of the circle. And here's the animation, which is pretty cool. <laughs> so now beginning with our expression for the total arc length of our circle, or its circumference, then if we substitute the derivatives of y up and y down with respect to x, then we get this expression over here. And upon further simplification, note that both the orange and green expressions are exactly the same. And this suggests some kind of symmetry across the x-axis. So now since the arc lengths corresponding to the top and bottom parts of the circle are equal, um, suggesting a symmetry across the x-axis, we can now simplify accordingly.
And so now, in order to solve for pi, we first need to establish that the arc length of our circle, s tot, is directly proportional to its radius r. We will do this by taking advantage of trigonometry and parametrizing the equation for our circle by a single variable, which we will call theta. And this theta will actually be an angle in the xy plane. But first we need to uh, derive an equation for arc length of a curve in the xy plane that is parametrized by a single variable. And here's the animation for this derivation. And we obtain the arc length in terms of theta. So now that we have the general equation for arc length of a line parametrized by theta in the xy plane, we will make specific substitutions that represent our circle. So our circle is parametrized by theta such that x is equal to r times cosine of theta and y is equal to r times sine of theta. So we now proceed with the correct substitutions into this general equation for arc length. And then we simplify even further. And then if we use the trigonometric identity that states that sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta is equal to 1, then we obtain the equation s tot is equal to r times the integral, the integral from theta min to theta max of a differential in theta. And then we expand the integral. So if we now set theta max equal to a constant that represents a full cycle around the circle and theta min equal to zero, then we have s tot is equal to r times c. We know that, that the radius of a circle, r, is half of the diameter of the circle. Um, thus, s tot is the diameter d multiplied by our constant c over 2. And c over 2 happens to be a very special constant. It is what we call pi. This constant that we call pi is actually the proportionality constant that we multiply the diameter by to obtain the, the, <laughs> to obtain the circumference of the circle. And note that c is a constant. Therefore, pi must also be a constant, which is important. Therefore, we can solve for pi in terms of circumference of the circle, s tot, and diameter d. Recall that diameter is equal to twice the radius of the circle. And therefore, we could say that pi is equal to s tot over 2r. All right, so now we can express pi as a definite, uh, definite integral. So we have pi is equal to s tot over 2r. And we also have um, s tot is equal to a definite integral, as shown right there. And so. Um, we can substitute s tot into our expression for, for, for pi, and we obtain pi is equal to this definite integral in green right there. So note that although it may seem like pi is a function of r, it is actually a constant. Because remember, we set pi equal to c over 2, where c is a constant. And therefore, pi must also be a constant. So it is pretty strange that it's in terms of r, but it's actually a constant. 
So we have this equation that expresses the constant pi as a definite integral. But how do we actually solve this thing? You know, like how do we solve it? Well, instead of finding an analytical solution to the integral, which I don't even know it's, if it's even possible to do that, we will actually perform a numerical approximation. And we, we will do this by first expressing the definite integral as a Riemann sum over index variable n. And then we could take out the limits as delta x approaches infinity and just say that for a, uh, for small values of uh, delta x, we will obtain values that are not exactly pi, but are close. And we can control how close our approximation for pi is to the true value of pi by changing the value of delta x right there. All right, so, so in general, the smaller the value of delta x, the closer the approximation will be to the true value. So we know that pi is a constant. It converges to the same value regardless of our choice for r. So we will arbitrarily, uh, sorry, arbitrarily, arbitrarily, arbitrarily <laughs> set r equal to 1. And so we then obtain the following approximation for pi, as shown over here. However, there's a small problem uh, in this formula over here. Can you spot it? This problem is that in the denominator, uh, when n is um, at its last value of 2r over delta x, this denominator is equal to 0. And so this means that the approximation will always diverge to infinity. But we don't really want this to happen. So how do we solve it? Well, we fix this problem by simply ignoring n is equal to 2r over delta x in the summation. So as delta x approaches 0, the expression evaluated at this value of n will approach 0. So making this change shouldn't really affect the convergence of the summation to the correct value of pi. So um, yeah, so we're going to make this change. Ah, oh, geez. Sorry I didn't put the animations in these slides. Ugh, I've been working on this for too long. I just want to get this video finished. Anyway, anyway, so um, we solve this problem by ignoring the last value of the, of the of n in the summation, aka we subtracted 1 from the upper bound. Thus, for r is equal to 1, we now have this, this same expression, except we subtracted 1 in the upper bound. It's plotting time. So now here are some plots. Uh, so for the plot to the left, uh, it shows the, the approximated value of pi as a function of our step size, delta x. And as you, could, you can see, the smaller the value for delta x, the better the approximation. And then for the plot to the right, um, uh, this plot shows the error. Which is the, which we define as the absolute value of the difference between the true value of pi and the approximated value of pi. This plot shows that as delta x approaches zero, the error also approaches zero, which is good. And so here we have <clears throat> a picture of the pi approximations for increasing delta x from top to bottom and left to right. So note that for smaller values of delta x, the approximation is closer to pi than for larger values of delta x. And this makes sense. And I use the R programming language to generate these plots, um, which really helped familiarize me with this language. And I have researched beginning in the fall 
which heavily relies on this programming language of R. So it's really good that I got some practice. Pretty good. And so that is it for today. Driving Pi was slightly more involved than I thought, but I learned a few things on the way, which is good. And um, we see that we can use calculus to get pi instead of doing it the caveman way of drawing a circle in the dirt and using a roller or something like that to measure the circle. So yeah, anyway, now this video is complete and I may finally rest. And I hope that you all have a great day. Or if it is night, I hope that you awaken fully rejuvenated. And that is it for today.